We are continuing our season on voting and abstention today by talking about some of the specifics of, uh, of voting and the morality of voting. In the last episode, I, uh, I read a chapter from Aidan Balu's Christian Non-Resistance and All Its Important Bearings, and uh, where he lays out this case that if you divest your power in, in a government through voting or, or agreeing to the Constitution or whatever, that any of the evil done with that divestment of power is done in your name, is, is your responsibility. You can't take on the good without also taking responsibility for the bad. So um, I think it's a, a really important argument, and I really think you should read his whole work, especially I think it was chapters 6 or 7 as well, where he, uh, where he talks more specifically um, in, in even more detail about the government and, and uh, the morality that's kind of wrapped up in all of that. But in this episode, we are going to move into, we're going to kind of zoom in and move into some more specifics. Rather than looking at the overall moral case against voting, we are going to try to highlight some of the, the more specific biblical principles as to what a moral candidate might look like for Christians um, if voting were to ever be something that's feasible. So at the time I recorded this episode originally, President Trump was relatively new into his presidency, and I was specifically looking at him as an exemplar for this episode and kind of comparing him to the biblical standards. But you could, of course, insert any candidate here and critique them similarly. In this episode, I make a number of points about biblical expectations for leaders. And the main crux of the argument is essentially that regardless of what country or institution we belong to, our leaders represent us before God. And this isn't only true of leaders in churches, but it's true of secular states as well. Pagan nations were judged by God for not adhering to just principles. So if you're going to say that we're not electing a pastor-in-chief, uh, which conservatives do quite frequently, um, that just doesn't jive with what we see of nations and judgment in the Bible, let alone with the notion of objective and universal morality that you know, we like to point to Romans and say that um, you know, uh, morality is objective and we're, we're all held to that standard. And then all of a sudden, uh, when we need to defend our vote, we say, well, well I'm not electing a pastor-in-chief. And it's, uh, it just seems duplicitous. So, for Christians, uh, particularly, this episode is going to be important because it's it's really important to understand what, like, how are the nations judged? What would a fit candidate look like? And can we apply biblical standards or objective moral standards in the political sphere? So here it is. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. We are continuing our discussion on consequentialism by discussing our final moral conundrum, which is about the morality of voting for a lesser of two evils. And for me, this is really the climax of the discussion because it is what started, what set into motion my discovery of consequentialism in my life and how consequentialism has really been a central ethic to not only my own life, but to the lives of most people in my culture. And maybe even uh, a central ethic for just humans in our sinful condition in general. Hopefully I will be able to draw in a lot of what we've talked about so far um, in, the, the last, uh, in the first eight episodes where I discussed some of the, the theological and philosophical issues, and then uncovered um, consequentialism in my own life and looked at uh, specific conundrums so that you can, you can really understand the consequentialist ethic and what it looks like as we've identified it in many different areas so far. And I'm also excited to discuss this topic because it seems to be one of the topics where we are particularly blind as politics is is more than just a means or a tool for us it is really an idol for most Americans it's something that we we put our hope in and 
I think that whereas you might never have to lie to save anybody's life, and while you probably won't have to deal with an ectopic pregnancy, you will have to deal with the morality of, of voting and uh, how we go about making decisions like that. So let's jump into the discussion, uh, but first I want to preface, a f- uh, preface the episode with a few things. I first want to rec- recognize that there is much more gray here than with some of the previous issues. I think on, on conservative Christian logic and the, the pro-life logic, I think the case against uh, the morality for ectopic um, pregnancies, uh, aborting and ectopic pregnancies, I think it's it's hard to have a pro-life logic and say that that's okay. Um, I think with the, the MASH conundrum and, and even the lying one where you, you can run out all of the implications for the Bible and God, I think those issues are are more clear than this political issue. Nevertheless, by understanding all of those other issues and seeing what consequentialism looks like, I think we can identify how that plays out in the situation of voting. And whereas there are going to be grays, I think it is is far less gray than we make it out to be. The second thing I want to say before uh, getting into the meat is that my conviction might come across as arrogant, and, and I don't want that to be the case. Unfortunately, in our culture, a lot of times when people say something that uh, is a judgment on another thing, for whatever reason, we have to get defensive and we can't hear that out. Um, and we attribute bad intent to the, peop- to the person who's um, pronouncing a judgment, and, and that's not at all what I want to do. I want to further the discussion. I want to tell you the conclusion that I've come to and the the thinking that's been going on in my life, which is why I don't just start with this episode and say uh, voting in this manner is wrong. Instead, I I thought about it for years. I told you about my journey. I told you about how consequentialism was and still is in my own life. This is by no means uh, a judgment where I'm saying um, people who vote in a particular manner are evil and I'm not. I'm just saying, hey Christians, let's let's think about this together and encourage each other to to do what we need to do, not to be Americans, but to be Christians. If I do come across as arrogant, or if I actually am arrogant or judgmental at any moment, please forgive me in advance. Uh, I would be happy to um, be confronted with with how I might be arrogant uh, or judgmental. Please let me know so I can. Uh, apologize and fix as I need to. At the same time, I'd, I'd ask that you be introspective during this. Uh, know that when something as core to your belief system as voting is to most Americans, uh, when that's confronted, you have a, a high chance of being defensive and, and blinded by biases and um, tradition and, and other sorts of things. So I want to challenge you to try to be as unbiased as possible, to think back about the previous episodes and and, um, just kind of prepare your mind to receive uh, the case that I'm about to make. All right, let's let's jump in. As I mentioned in, in the first episode of this series, the 26th presidential election was, um, as far as I can tell, a compromise with evil by the the. Christian right. Um, We excuse the presidential nominee and now current president for things that would have disqualified others only a decade or two before. Um, We see that uh, President Trump has a terrible family life. Uh, He's divorced two or three times. He's had lots of sexual exploits. He's a narcissist and arrogant. He fails to listen to advisors. Uh, and their wisdom. He coddles powerful tyrants. He glosses over evil for financial gain, like uh, um, the case with Kipchoge and not um, not uh, going after Saudi Arabia more. He's greedy. He's misogynistic and racist, or at least um, coddles 
groups who are and says things that uh, would make one have a long pause and, and certainly furthers those sorts of causes in the world. He's insensitive, he's aggressive, he lies and he lies and he lies and he lies. And I know I've, I've made lists several times as I try to um, think about everything in and, and several places that I discuss with people on Facebook and I know that I'm missing things here but I think that list is, is long enough. Um, President Trump is personally an evil immorally compromised individual. While I understand that no individual will be perfect, morally perfect, um, it seemed to me that President Trump wasn't simply imperfect. He was compromised. He wasn't flawed. He was compromised. Um, whereas somebody who's flawed will make mistakes, um, but may repent or uh, may not have glaring mistakes. Uh, he, President Trump has not only glaring mistakes, but mistakes which uh, he is unrepentant for. But that's okay, many Christians around me argued. Um, they said, we are not voting for a commander-in-chief. Uh, I'm sorry, we are not voting for a pastor-in-chief. We are voting for a commander-in-chief. So we can put those things to the side. Forget that we couldn't put those things to the side in the past. Uh, we can put them aside now. Because we need to be able to put those to the side in order to do the greatest good. Or to prevent the, the least amount of evil. But that, that whole pastor-in-chief thing didn't seem to be a biblical position. You look all throughout the scripture and people are judged by their king uh, all over the place. Whether it's Israel or Babylon or Syria... Um, if we elect somebody as our representative, then we are culpable for, for what they do. And if we don't want someone to represent us before God, then we shouldn't vote for them because they will represent us. And in a democracy, they represent us doubly so. You know, in, in Israel, you can't really help who the king is. And so if you're, if you're Daniel and his friends or uh, any of the other captives let off, if you lived a holy life and you were killed by the invading Assyrians or Babylonians, okay, you you received the consequence uh, for your nation, which was death and suffering, but when you stand before God, you won't receive consequence for your king's actions. In a democracy, I can't help but, but think that uh, you will receive, if you are voting for somebody who's evil, um, not only are you represented and, and may receive natural consequences of your, your president's actions, but there's also a moral component because you help to choose who becomes president. It's also uh, saying that we're not voting for a pastor-in-chief is also a really hypocritical position. See, Christians view voting as a hugely important, morally weighty act, right? Because the the person that you're voting for, you want to accomplish moral things. But at the same time, we're then divorcing the impetus of adhering to objective morality from the position for which we're voting. So we recognize that voting is a moral endeavor because we want to a, a, enact morality through the position of president but then at the same time, we say we don't have to adhere to objective morality in in this uh, in who we vote for or the platform we vote for. And that just doesn't make any sense. It, is this a moral thing that we're trying to accomplish, or isn't it? And if it is a moral thing, then it seems like we are uh, we need to be adhering to moral means and to moral standards. So the religious right views politics as a moral sledgehammer, yet the gross immorality of a leader and platform aren't disqualifications for our promotion of these individuals and platforms. Um, it, it's a double standard. It's, it's a moral convenience. Um, it's convenient for us to, uh, to, to use this argument because we can kind of get some of the things we want, um, even though that means that we have to adhere to an evil.
so we can excuse our evil act yet still maintain that we are um, we are trying to further morality and that just doesn't doesn't work what I want to do first then is I want to explore uh, several distinct ways that the Bible discusses that which is good and that which is to be upheld the first area I want to discuss is going to be personal character first John and Paul talk kind of about the the theory of love what is what is love and who has love um, God loved us so if we are in God then we will love other people and love Paul gives us a, a list of the attributes that love true love has in 1 Corinthians 13 and then James shows us what what love has in our personal practice we we see something interesting in 1 Corinthians 11, only two chapters prior to the, the passage on love. Um, and it's one of two times that I, I can think of that we see death as a judgment of God in the New Testament. Um, actual death. So we see Ananias and Sapphira. We know that they are killed um, for um, lying to God. But we also see in 1 Corinthians 11 uh, this passage that, that is often used to kind of tell people ask God for forgiveness before you come to to the Lord's table bef uh, before the Eucharist before communion uh, and while I think that's an important thing what almost everybody fails to warn is that that this this issue in first Corinthians 11 about discern looking through our hearts and our our, uh, our actions it deals specifically with how we treat the uh, the lesser, the the weaker in our community, and Paul even tells us that people have died because they were discriminating against other people, the rich against the poor, and it's, it's only one of two times that I can think of that we see death in the New Testament. So First John and Paul talk about love. James tells us uh, not to not to have preferences for the wealthy over the poor. We see that discrimination against the weaker actually has led to death. In 1 Corinthians 11. And we also see in the Old Testament that um, it this discrimination against the weak, this injustice, is the primary or secondary cause of exile, depending on where you read it. Uh, idolatry was a big issue that led to exile, but so also was injustice. Injustice against the poor, the widow, the weak, the orphan. Um, so love is is central to what it means to be human, to be a follower of God. And that love is portrayed as a seeking of justice, especially for those on the fringes of society, and those who are weaker. While the Bible gives us many personal characteristics that I could nitpick, since I think love is so clearly central to, to personal morality, and its absence towards God and others, the cause of, of God's judgment, the main cause, we'll just, we'll just move forward with love. I'm just going to pick love. That is, is the only personal characteristic I'm going to emphasize. Now, it's true that we are not voting for a pastor-in-chief. Um, so, I, you know, I, I will right now throw off all of the other personal attributes that you'd expect a Christian to have, the fruits of the Spirit, uh, the other eight fruits of the Spirit, right? Uh, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Uh, no, I'm missing one or two there. So we wouldn't expect people outside of the church to necessarily have that. But I would not want to promote someone to president. I would not want to put my stamp on them, on someone who fails the love test. That if I know that Israel was exiled because they, they failed to love and do justice, if I know that one of the reasons, one of the only reasons we see Christians dying, presumably at the hands of God, in the New Testament, is because they were acting unjustly towards the poor and the weak, then I would, uh, I would take that into consideration voting for a president. And, and looking at the morality of, of what I'd want to uphold. But you know what? I, 
even though I'm putting all of those other characteristics to the side and only focusing on love, I, I would say that I should really be able to hold President Trump up to the highest standard because he is, by, uh, by his own admission, he says that he is a Christian. And so he directly represents Christ through his proclamation. So therefore, uh, while I'm just sticking with love for this episode, know that really we should be able to hold President Trump up to uh, all of the Christian standards. Beyond the, the mere personal uh, aspect of what we find being important for, for leaders and morality in the Bible, there is also there are these characteristics of leaders of God's kingdom. Now, I recognize that uh, the, our president doesn't necessarily need to be a Christian, uh, even though they do represent us. And, but but I want to look at the, the qualifications for elders and deacons because um, even though our, our president doesn't have to be a pastor-in-chief, I think you can find some important aspects of what God desires when you look at what he seeks for leadership of his kingdom. It's sort of like a lot of conservative Christians will uh, have a significant problem with homosexuality. And you do find, um, I think, two verses in the, the New Testament that, uh, that seem to speak directly against uh, homosexuality. But one of the main arguments that they're going to use is you have, you have several, uh, several laws in the Old Testament, I think maybe two or three places, which discuss the abomination, I think that's the word it uses, the abomination of um, temple prostitution or, or homosexuality. And so we, we kind of use the Old Testament law, even though we are no longer in Israel and we're not in that, that civil government. But we say, hey, look, God shows us the types of things he finds important in the Old Testament, and God still has the same character today, so... Um, we would we would expect that this would still be sinful for humans, even if it's not part of our law. So I'm going to kind of say the same thing here. All right, presidents don't have to be elders or deacons. They don't have to be our pastors in chief. But I would think that God shows us what he seeks in elders and deacons. That's probably the, the types of things that I want to seek in a president, too. I mean, the more things I see in a president that are, are like these lists, probably the better off I'm going to be, because these are the kinds of things that God thinks good leaders would have. And if morality is objective, it would seem kind of odd that God would think uh, a good leader in the church should act differently than uh, if he were a leader who's a Christian as a president. In 1 Timothy 3, we get an elder list, and it says they should be above reproach, husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, gentle and not violent, not a lover of money, manages their own household well, not puffed up with conceit, and well thought of by outsiders. We could focus on, on a lot of the attributes from that list, but... I'm going to focus on two here. There are two which are linked with the devil. Being puffed up with conceit is linked with the condemnation of the devil. And not having a good reputation to outsiders is linked to um, being a snare of the devil. So even if you're like, well, we don't have a pastor in chief, so if they're not, if they're not hospitable or able to teach that's okay. They don't have to be. Um, but if you're puffed up with conceit and have the condemnation of the devil, and if not having a good reputation to outsiders, especially if you're a self-proclaimed Christian, um, if that's a snare of the devil, then that seems like those are, are two pretty big issues that would be problems if, if uh, the candidate you're voting for is is going to be guilty there. All right, so we we focus on two areas so far: the the character of leaders in God's kingdom, and the personal character of of individuals. And while I don't, I think maybe the the personal character, the the attribute of love, I think that's pretty weighty. Uh, 
Um, the character of, of leaders in God's kingdom, maybe not so weighty, but still interesting. We're going to move on to our, our third area, which I think should carry probably quite a bit more of the weight, and that is the political character of individuals that we see throughout the Bible. So if you're dismissive of the of the first two categ- uh, categories, especially the second one, then you may want to listen up to this category. Before we get into the, the specifics, we need to address some common miscon- uh, a common misconception, which is that the Old Testament doesn't apply to us today in terms of of its political discussion because Israel was a theocracy. There, there are a couple of things I want to say to that, and that's, first of all, God's moral commands are objective and for all people at all times, other than sacramental and civil laws that are uh, which are specific to Israel. God's moral law is always applicable, and even in many of the sacramental laws or the civil laws, we see that they are a means to show and help us adhere to to God's higher moral law. So, for instance, you know, there's the Sabbath, which uh, we don't necessarily want to make a uh, a national law, but that um, has helped us to recognize the importance of community and others in God's kingdom. Beyond the fact that God's moral commands are objective, we also see God judge nations outside of Israel. So it wasn't just Israel, the theocracy, that God um, held to certain moral standards. God held other countries, nations that we see uh, specifically, who are judged for their immorality. We see Canaan, Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon um, Canaan, I guess, is more of a region of lots of, maybe you call them countries. And we see lots of people come under the judgment of God, lots of rulers, uh, besides Israel, for their evil. So it really is irrelevant if we're electing a pastor in chief, we can still be judged because God's morality is objective. Third, uh, after the book of Judges, Israel is not a theocracy. When, when kings rule, when Israel takes on politics outside of God, that's not a theocracy. Israel was a theocracy up until Saul. After Saul, Israel is no longer a theocracy because they have a king. And we see plenty of political discourse related to Israel after they're no longer a theocracy. And, and fourth, I want to say, and this I know is going to be controversial, uh, though I, I guess I don't understand why it would be. But Christians today do live in a theocracy. I'll let that sink in. W- we do live in a theocracy. Now, I know Israel not being in a theocracy post-judges and Christians living in a theocracy. I know that those are going to be contended. So l- let's kind of delve into that story a little bit so that we can come to to an understanding together. See, God never wanted a king, right? God wanted the theocracy. He wanted to always be the ruler. When Israel was granted a king, God did maintain authority through the prophets, and he expected compliance with his law. But he expected compliance with his law to all nations. And in fact, he sent prophets to other nations too. We see Jonah specifically going to Assyria, and pronouncing God's judgment. And we see Assyria and Babylon judged. So we know that God maintains authority over all things, even even um, nations that weren't Israel. Nevertheless, God did give Israel a king, and he was pretty ticked about it too. For Samuel 10. Go and check that out, and you see God is not happy. He warns the people not to uh, bypass him and get a king. They want it anyway. He says, all right, you guys don't realize what you're getting yourself into, but here you go. I'll step to the side. I'm still I'm still in control. My morality still stands, but you got your king. And throughout the Bible, God continues to have disdain for for kingship, for people usurping his role, his role of, of the king. Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 16 specifically. I mean, that that whole chapter is a lot about how God guides the king's hearts and how he is sovereign even over them. 
Daniel talks about the types of people that God appoints, and uh, he he appoints lowly people. And we don't mean lowly like as in uh, unimportant, because we know that God does use weak people. We're talking about base, base people, like uh, debased people, uh, people who are... Uh, he allows wicked people to rule uh, in his providence, and he brings good out of it. So we keep traveling through the Old Testament, and we see that God has stepped aside because of the hardness of his people's hearts. And there is no theocracy um, from Saul on, though God plays a, a an important role in Israel throughout uh, the time, but largely through the prophets. But the end goal for God is not to leave Israel and the world in despair. His goal is to appoint, appoint his everlasting ruler. And that everlasting ruler is Jesus Christ, and he fulfills all roles, prophet, priest, and king. Read any of the Gospels, especially Mark, and you see that the kingdom uh, was brought with Jesus. It's not future, it is current. Uh, and yes, there's a future aspect to it, but Jesus has brought the kingdom now. And upon his death, we see that Jesus is seated indicating that, that his, um, his work is accomplished. And Hebrews tells us as much, that upon his death, he is seated at the right hand of God. In fact, he tells the Pharisees, um, before his death, he says, today you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, uh, and, uh, or ascending on the clouds. Uh, and essentially he tells them, that's, that's from Daniel, I believe Daniel 7 or 9. And it's this, the, the Son of Man, the God-man, ascends to heaven to take his rightful place as ruler, as king. And Jesus says, today you're going to see that, right? And that's right, right as he's going to the cross. So Jesus is king and ruler now. Ephesians shows, it tells us that he is reigning in power now and gives us all, all uh, heavenly gifts. First Peter affirms Christ's rule. We are subjects to, to his kingdom and we... We obey and submit to him. We only submit to authorities on earth. We don't, we don't have to obey them uh, if their, their rule conflicts with God's rule because we are aliens here. So the theocracy has been established. If you are a Christian, you are in Christ's kingdom that he brought 2,000 years ago and that he, uh, he came to rule when he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We are his servants in his kingdom now, and we are only aliens in this world. Um, we're in a theocracy. While we are, perhaps we could view it like being in exile, as the Jews were, and while we may seek the welfare of our city, we do not seek the welfare of our city at a compromise to our allegiance. And just like Daniel didn't compromise uh, his ethics and, and rituals that he was... Uh, he was bound to, even in the face of death, um, just as they didn't compromise. Well, we don't compromise in, in our seeking of the welfare of our city either, because we are aliens in our city. We are exiles. So all of this is to say that when the Old Testament speaks about political qualifications for leaders, we ought to listen because God's moral commands are objective and for all times and for all people, whether they were Israel or not. We know that God judges nations outside of his own nation, and specifically, he judges ones for moral failing in the realm of idolatry and a failure to do justice to the downtrodden. We know that God's political desires were given to his people when they weren't in a theocracy, and we are no less a theocracy now because all Christians live in the established kingdom where Christ reigns in power as we speak. With those things in mind, as to the applicability of the political ideas found in the Old Testament, let's talk about God's Old Testament requirements for kings. There are seven main requirements found in Exodus. I believe it's Exodus. Number one, it's a person God chooses. Number two, they're to be a fellow Israelite. Number three, they're not to accumulate many horses. Number four, not to take many wives. Number five, not to accumulate great wealth. Number six, not to consider themselves above others. And number seven, 
they are to follow the decrees of God. Now obviously there are a few of these that uh, were written specifically to Israel and aren't going to be able to be used by us today, like they are to be a fellow Israelite. Uh, if the analogy stands, maybe that is saying um, for Americans, if you're going to say they need to be a fellow uh, kingdom individual, maybe it is saying you are electing pastor-in-chief. You are electing someone who has the values um, who, of, of your kingdom group, a person who is a Christian, who does follow God. So maybe you can, you can take that analogy. But I'll toss that to the side um, just because I don't feel like I, I'm at liberty to take that that far. A person God chooses, um, you know, everybody should be praying about that, of course. But let, let's take a look at, at uh, the next couple, because most of the rest, I think, you can carry over pretty easily. Number three was not to accumulate many horses. And Israel was, was not supposed to have a standing army. You know, we actually see David have um, get in pretty big trouble for taking a census to identify how powerful he was. God was God was pretty upset because kings were not supposed to have many horses and they weren't supposed to go back down to Egypt to, to buy horses and char or chariots. And that was to say that uh, a lot of times Israel, when they needed an army, they had to call everybody up and get people from the tribes. And even when they did that, they said, hey, if you just got married, if you just planted a vineyard, just stay back. Like, don't come and join. Because the point of Israel was to rely on God. It was not to trust in, in their might and to have a standing army. And we see that in the lack of accumulation of horses. Not take many wives. Um, part of that was, we know I believe with Solomon, that uh, wives could be enticing. It could entice uh, leaders to other gods. Because if you're taking many wives, some of them are probably coming from other countries as political gestures, and they can lead you into idolatry. So, uh, number three, I guess maybe you'd say warmongering. Number four, the issue is idolatry. Number five, not to accumulate great wealth. And that could be God does warn about having kings and saying that... Um, you know they're gonna they're gonna take your 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 boys and make them slaves. They're gonna take your women and make them wives. They're gonna tax you. So the accumulation of great wealth likely means that they're not doing good for their people, but they're taking advantage of their people. Number six, not to consider themselves above others. And that is in line with our our passage on elders, which um, views that as a, a condemnation of Satan when when you elevate yourself. And then seven, followed the decrees of God, which is pretty pretty self-explanatory. So those are some of our our uh, specific issues with leaders and some of the things that um, that God expected of good kings. And then we can also take a look in in Proverbs sixteen. Um, because our, our episode is going to be long enough, I'm not going to read that. But I would challenge you to read read Proverbs sixteen. And notice the things that are good and the things that are bad there and the things that kings are supposed to be doing. And also notice, and this is really important, that it sort of echoes Romans 13 because the, the point in Proverbs 16 isn't that oh, if you don't pick a king, God isn't in control. Right? If you don't pick the right king, um, God is in control regardless. Right? The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And that's essentially what Romans 13 says, too. Hey, look, God establishes kings. He orders them. You don't need to worry about them. They have their function, but God is ultimately sovereign. Uh, so it's about God's sovereignty even through, through uh, whoever becomes the leader. Okay, so that is... Those are basically all of the categories that, that uh, we'll take a look at in the Bible. Personal... Uh, issues, the the types of leaders that God wants to see for his his people, uh, his church specifically, and then general political guidelines for Israel and and other countries um, through through his kingly 
uh, desires in Exodus and through other desires we see in Proverbs 16. Now here's the, the Christian's conundrum as we discern all of this. We don't want to be ineffective or escapist, but we want to obey God and we don't want to be immoral. While I point at Trump's supporters specifically for compromising morals to be effective, um, and and this is also true, of course, you know, for the Christian to embrace Hillary Clinton and the issues that, uh, or or any other Democrat and the issues that they have with abortion and um, and other issues. I mean, it goes both ways. But because I'm I'm coming from a conservative background, I'm picking on the conservatives throughout this. So while I point at the Trump supporters, at the conservatives, for compromising their morals in order to be effective, they accuse me of arguing a position that is ineffectual, and that is that is really like a holier-than-thou attitude. Like, well, I'm not going to do any good in the world, but at least I'm, I'm doing the right thing. So they, they see that as pharisaical, and I, I get that, and I will address that um, in, in later episodes, but... Uh, that that's kind of where we're at. We're at a standstill, pointing fingers at each other. So if you can just hold off for another episode or two until I get to the the Pharisaical uh, counter rebuttal. Right now, what I just want to say is is that I want to highlight the untenable double standard held by those who have elevated effectiveness above holiness. I before I defend my position, I want to tell you why your position has some big problems. Here's the here's the main dilemma I see. How can it be argued that we should dismiss biblical morality on a religious, personal, governmental, and societal level when electing a candidate or party? Because if I don't accept moral compromise, then I will compromise myself by not advancing some personal, religious, governmental, or societal morality. You might want to rewind that and listen to it once or twice more. But here's a summary. I, here's what they're saying. I need to compromise my morality to advance morality. That just that doesn't work. That doesn't make sense. You don't compromise morality to advance morality. That's it's not even a paradox. That's, a, that's nonsensical. That's just we call that immorality. So here's a, here's another way to kind of look at it. The conservatives want to say that my position is wrong for refusing to divorce objective morality from the means, right? They that's what they want me to do. They want me to say, well, we can use evil means. I'm going to put objective morality to the side. Okay, I'll use these means, and then oh, my guy got in. I'll bring objective morality back. Now that's what we want to accomplish. So I, they want me to put it to the side for a bit so that I can use means that are convenient and effective and, and good for controlling. Conservatives are essentially saying that if we don't get a lesser evil in who can give us a better environment where objective morality can be advanced, then we can't be moral in the means right so we have to we have to get to to good ends in order to then be able to live out good means we can't we don't do it in reverse we don't always have good means even if those don't lead to good ends it's consequentialist and of course i i know that we live in a fallen world but the question is whether we are to then live fallenly and you know, another question is, is objective morality so important that we're willing to sacrifice morality itself to achieve it? And is that even possible? Does that even make sense? Is that coherent? No, it, it doesn't seem like it is. We're not to live fallenly in a fallen world, and we're not to sacrifice morality to get morality. Those Those things are just incoherent. But that's what I'm told that's what Christian conservatives are, are telling everybody that we have to do. We have to sacrifice our morality, our standards, in order to advance morality, uh, to advance our cause. 
it, it reminds me a lot of the Pharisees. Um, John eleven forty eight. The, the Pharisees say this. They say, if we let him go on like this, speaking of Jesus, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. You look at the rhetoric today, and that's exactly what Christian conservatives are saying. They're saying, if if we let the world go on like this, if we let our society go on like this, um, if, if we don't grasp control right now, then we are going to lose both our temple and our nation. We're going to lose our Christian heritage. We hear that all the time, right? Make America great again. Like who? Like, like the founding fathers who are all Christians. That's what conservative Christians mean. Um, we don't want to lose our nation, right? That's why we have such a big problem with people kneeling for the flag, people not being patriotic enough, um, why we have flags in churches, American flags next to Christian flags, higher than Christian flags. Um, I mean, we don't want to lose our nation and the control that we have over the nation because Christians have been in control for a long time, able to make all kinds of laws um, that are, are preferential to Christians and uh, persecute or, maybe that's a harsh word, um, not persecute, but discriminate against other religions. At the same time, we don't want to lose our temple. We don't want to lose our, our position. We don't want to lose tax exemption, which I'm not sure why, why the church has in the first place, but that's another, another discussion. But we don't want to lose tax exemption. We don't want to lose um, we, the, the hold of, that we have over power. We don't want the Ten Commandments to be taken out of, of courthouses because we like having those we like having pieces of christianity all over the place in people's faces because we are a sacralist society in which we think that um you know if we have these pieces of us all over the place in people's faces that's kind of a sign that we're christian and that's important so we're just like the pharisees we we prioritize the temple and the nation uh, not realizing that what's best for our nation and what's best for the church isn't to be sacralistic or to be a sacralist society, sacral society. Um, and and we, we feel like we have to maintain control at the cost of holiness and morality. For as, as frustrated as I am with my conservative Christian community, I empathize with, with the political idolatry. Uh, on both sides, I empathize with, with feeling like our hope is in politics. We have to change with our vote in order to make things right. But we can see where that, where that got Israel, right? In their alliance with Egypt or Israel with their crucifixion of the Messiah. Those, those were political compromises. Those, or those were, those were things that they did that they thought were best for their nation to preserve the temple and the nation. Um, but both eventually ended in exile uh, with Assyria and Babylon, and then um, the crucifixion of the Messiah eventually led to the destruction of the temple in, in 70 A.D. The things we think we do for God, the sacrifices we make, um, smell terrible to God a lot of times because God desires obedience rather than sacrifice. Today we compromise by our alliances with leaders whose actions are foreign to God and we find that a life of bearing a cross is ineffective. That bearing of a cross is good enough for our Savior but it is, it is not good for us. Our means are better than God's means, and we know what God wants and how to best get it. And that's how we're going to do it. In the end, I'm going to argue that the Bible is pretty clear, the type of personal character somebody should have, the types of leadership attributes God desires, the type of political uh, political platforms and characteristics God would seek in a king. President Trump certainly does not fit the bill. <laughs>
and nor would I say did Hillary or her platform. Um, and I really can't say who does. And that brings us into some important questions, and I would refer you back to uh, the Romans 13 discussion that I had in, in my in season one on nonviolence, I believe episodes 12 and 13. Um, in episode 13 and part two of the Romans 13 series in particular, I discuss kind of the ex the extreme implications. What if, what if you can't align with any person or party? Does that mean that you don't vote? What what are the implications there? And I want to do a couple episodes on on abstention from voting. I think that would be worthwhile. But at least in that Romans 13 episode, I, I discuss a lot about if you couldn't find yourself voting for any person or any party. What does that mean for the church? What does that mean? And I, I don't know. I am I think there is gray here. I don't know what party or person um, would be legitimate to vote for. But I think it's one of those things you can see which people for sure are not good to vote for. And and uh, Trump is, is certainly f not just flawed. He's compromised. So... Those are my two cents. Um, hopefully, this uh, this makes sense in the grand scheme of, of all of the consequentialist discussions that that I've had leading up to this point. I look forward to talking about rebuttals next to show how how this isn't escapist and this isn't pharisaical. And hopefully, you'll you'll hear me out on those. So that's all for now. So peace, because I'm a pacifist, and I say it, I mean it.